topic is uh, on um, pharmaceutical policy, specifically looking at the uh, drug approval process in the country. Uh, for those of you who've been coming each week, uh, you know that we sort of address a different topic each week. We have um, one more of these, there won't be one next week because of the, the holiday, uh, but then we'll reconvene uh, on December uh, 4th to uh, finish it off with talking a little bit about um, the Affordable Care Act, uh, you know, where, where our experts are gonna speak, see things headed, and as we were chatting about uh, tonight, uh, probably they'll also address a little bit of some of the uh, current uh, issues or challenges, shall we say, that have arisen in trying to uh, implement the Act's main provision, which is providing health insurance to people. Um, so hopefully you can come out for that one, uh, and uh, that, that's a good way, I think, to end this, this series. So tonight, um, we're going to, title of the, the session is The Prescription Drug Pipeline Too Slow for Our Own Good? Question mark. So um, it's that question mark that I think the speakers will be, be addressing. And uh, um, we'll introduce them in a second, but this is a topic that, for me, is very interesting because um, I was, uh, it, for, for, I was on a committee, an Institute of Medicine committee a few years ago that, that was charged with looking at the National Vaccine Plan, which is a plan the government put together around vaccine development to try and oversee vaccine development. And, and as part of the, the committee's work, we, we ended up inviting people in, uh, high up officials from the FDA and to ask about, because there's a lot of uh, issues around vaccines and, and what, you know, how long they take to develop and bring to market and is it a disincentive for companies to, uh, you know, want to make vaccines because it, it's just uh, too problematic a process, uh, too cost intensive uh, with no guarantee that, you know, their vaccine will ever make it to market. And so I remember we brought in, uh, the committee brought in officials from the FDA to talk about you know, the, the approval process generally. And I remember as someone who was not very familiar with that process, how utterly confusing and sort of bizarre it, it, it seemed to me, um, you know, just the, the whole uh, sort of uh, uh, environment around drug approval. And, and this is the report that we ended up uh, putting out as a committee. And, you know, uh, I just, you know, one part of the report, which I think the speakers hopefully will talk to a little bit, um, you know, says some of the regulatory barriers to vaccine development are not related to problems of vaccine quality, safety, or efficacy. Rather, they appear to be linked to organizational and policy matters and may reflect bureaucratic obstacles rather than scientific processes and priorities. Some regulatory barriers may relate to communication challenges between manufacturers and regulators, including the FDA, misunderstandings or procedural requirements that may be tangential to a study. Um, and, and so I remember our committee, you know, which had a lot of vaccine experts on it, really talking about how it wasn't just the, the drug approval process, it was just the whole way that the FDA is an agency related to manufacturers and, and sort of the, the, the communication that occurred or didn't, didn't occur. So, so I came out of that really thinking, wow, this is, this is a process that the average person doesn't know very much about. Um, and then it struck me again earlier in the spring when the FDA came out and said that they were going to uh, start moving uh, drugs for dementia quicker to market, um, you know, that, that, that the criteria were gonna change. That sort of made me think as a policy person, well, okay, then I guess the approval process isn't so set in stone. I guess there's really, there's really a lot of manipulations that can be done to it for the right issue or the right drug or the right set of circumstances. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward, having seen their, their slides for tonight, to, uh, to hear more about it. Uh, I'd like to introduce now Joan Fitzgerald, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, and she is um, the Dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. She also really is the, um, you know, I think the driving force behind this, the, the Open Classroom series. So without further ado, I'd like to bring Joan up. Thanks, Tim. Dr. Sidney Wolf, um, who founded the Public Citizen Health Research Group with Ralph Nader in 1971, is something of a legend. Under Dr. Wolf's leadership, the Health Research Group has published innumerable studies on the efficacy, misuse, and adverse effects 
of countless drugs and has been and has compelled the Food and Drug Administration to serve the public interest. Journalists, congressional committees have long looked to him as an incorruptible tribune of the public interest. The public interest. He is a MacArthur Genius Award recipient, contributor to scholarly medical journals, as well as an adjunct professor of internal med medicine at Case Western Reserve University, and also a serious classical pianist. <coughs> He is the author and editor of the best-selling Consumer Guide, that you can see up here, and you may be familiar with, Worst Pills, Best, or Best Pills, Worst Pills, which has been regularly updated since it was first published in 1981. He is also a longtime family friend. My husband was best man at Sid's wedding. He gave the first toast at our wedding. And it's a friendship that we cherish, and I'm proud to be introducing you tonight. Thanks for coming to Boston. <laughs> the keyboard that was here is not here. Right out. What? It's the tray right down below. Right. 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 I think that neither Ken will speak after me or I chose this title, but given that the title is there, we'll certainly talk at some, in some way about the problem that the title evinces when you look at it. Uh, the, the drug pipeline, which is partly the companies, partly the FDA, is it too slow for our own good? A rhetorical question, and I have some thoughts about that, and it depends what kind of drugs you're talking about also. This, this may sound initially that this is some kind of rhetorical thing, and when I first read some of the background information, I wasn't sure what it was, but are there significant differences between those who illegally sell dangerous street drugs and the more prestigious, in quote, and sometimes legal, sometimes legal because there are a lot of legal problems that the pharmaceutical industry has increasingly gotten into recently. Of course there are differences, but the first large international pharmaceutical company in the world, Bayer, and the street drug industry have one thing clearly in common, and it's heroin. We begin at a time when there wasn't any pipeline because there was no FDA and there really was no regulation of drugs at all, and therefore one could describe things then as an open, unfettered pipeline. Fifteen years ago, after an enormous amount of research, getting a hold of documents and so forth, a large staff at the British Sun the London Sunday Times marked the 100th anniversary, I'm not sure one should call it an anniversary, of the commercial launch of heroin by publishing a very long, detailed, and I'll show you one of the documents from it, summary about the company that owned the drug. <coughs> name. Heroin is a brand name. So a Bayer chemist, a chemist, who wasn't a biochemist, Heinrich Tresser first tested the drug in animals and then on himself and other employees at the company. And as the article in the London Times states, the workers loved the drug. Some saying it made them feel heroic, the German word for heroic. Thus, a brand name with a trademark was born. It's named after making people feel heroic. Uh, things moved pretty quickly. They got a trademark in June of 19, 1898, and they started stating some things that, in retrospect, remind us something of what Purdue did with OxyContin. They said it's ten times more effective as a cough medicine, it was heavily promoted as a cough medicine, than codeine, only a tenth of the toxin, so <coughs> accentuating the positive, minimizing the negative. It was a song in the 40s like that. <laughs> Uh, the new drug was thought to work better than morphine, but being safe and not addictive. It was very successful, you can imagine, and particularly in this country. And Bayer sent out free samples of heroin to thousands of European and U.S. physicians, and one year after the presentation and the year that the trademark was obtained by Bayer, 
The production of the drug was about one ton per year with exports going to 23 countries. And the United States was a country where it took off more, according to these documents, than anywhere else. There was already a large population of morphine addicts, a craze for patent medicines. The Barnes Museum in Philadelphia is named after a person who made a fortune selling patent medicines around the same period of time, and a relatively lax regulatory framework. Lax meaning that the FDA didn't really have any legal framework to look at drug safety until 1938, which is well after that. Manufacturers of cough syrup were soon lacing their products with bare heroin. I, I didn't put the trademark on this, but you get the idea. <laughs> An ad appearing in the American Journal of Pharmacy promoted the drug to drug manufacturers as a cough medicine ingredient at the very reasonable price, even if you adjust for inflation, of $4.85 an ounce. And many of these products were sold over the counter. And this is an ad from the American Journal of Pharmacy. The heroin is preeminently adapted for the manufacture of cough elixirs cough balsams, cough drops, etc. Price in one ounce packages, $484.85 per ounce, less in larger quantities. Efficient dose being very small. And again, the cheapest specific for the relief of cough, and bronchitis, phthisis, whooping cough, and so forth. <clears throat> well, needless to say, because the pharmacology of it was not any different then than now, although it probably wasn't as carefully studied, a uh, massive number of heroin-related admissions to U.S. hospitals and deaths in the company, wisely from their perspective, stopped making the drug in 1913, just 15 years after they had marketed And this was an interesting fact, it may seem irrelevant, but there was a big population of recreational users in this country who didn't have enough money for heroin, so they would then in a more civil way than stealing or hitting people on the head or whatever, they would support their habit through the sale of scrap metal and the name junkie came from there. So again, the question, are there significant differences? Uh, there obviously are some, but heroin is a common denominator and the next few slides will look at what to me, even to me, was very cynical, surprising evidence of a rapidly increasing amount of criminal and civil violations by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the years in the bottom are 1990 through, 19, through 2012. In 1863, a defense contractor cheated the U.S. government, not the first and certainly not the last, and that was the occasion for passing something called the False Claims Act, which said if you are a contractor to the government or doing business with it in any way and you cheat, we can prosecute you for making a false claim. The blue are the defense industry. What you can see is that up until not too long ago, virtually all the false claims activity in this country was the defense industry. And then starting about 10 years ago, red, the pharmaceutical industry started getting in here. Now these are just financial penalties on the False <coughs> Claims Act. There are other categories as well, which I'll go into. So as of a few years ago, the pharmaceutical industry swamped out the defense industry, and it, there's no evidence that that is changing at all now as really the number one defraud of the federal government. Now here are the penalties, the total penalties include criminal, red, and civil, blue. And what you can see again is that up until 10 years ago, 12, 13 <coughs> years ago, these didn't even show up on this graph. The left axis is essentially a thousand millions or a billion dollars, the lowest number on the left axis. And what you can see is starting then more and more pharmaceutical industry, civil penalties and criminal penalties. So that for instance in 2012, just through July 18th, it's really these data are on our website, and I'll show you how you can get these at the end. Uh, the majority of the penalties were still civil, 
but a lot of them, as in 1.7 billion, were criminal penalties. Now, when J.P. Morgan coughs up as they're about two thirteen billion dollars, these are financial problems, so to speak, and people get cheated. But one of the additional categories of problems are caused by at least many of these violations by the pharmaceutical industry is injuring and or killing people. So these are this is a pie chart of the nature of the violation, and the number one terms of quantity is unlawful promotion. When the FDA approves a drug, they presumably have enough evidence to show that the benefits outweigh the risks, and it is approved for that indication. If a company would like to, even though it's illegal, make it appear that the drug is good for something else, they will do unlawful promotion. If a doctor gets one of these drugs, there's nothing to stop them from prescribing it for some off-label use, but the companies are forbidden with criminal penalties applying if they advertise it that way. And one of the recent, 10, 12 years ago now, examples is Pfizer with Neurontin, a drug that was approved then for one indication, and 90% of the prescriptions were found to be for the off-label use. They were hiring physicians to go around and create a buzz that, well, it's only approved for this, but it's good for that. So that's a category where, by definition, if something has not been approved for a particular use, it is likely, not certain, that there isn't sufficient evidence that the benefits outweigh the risks. If there were sufficient evidence, then the, the FDA could approve it, and they could legally promote it for that. And if a doctor is prescribing a drug because a Pfizer-hired person uh, convince them to do it even though it wasn't approved, the person may wind up having injury or harm that is far in excess of the benefit because it may not even be the case that there's any evidence of a benefit. Another category that clearly can harm patients uh, is withholding information from the government, uh, concealing study findings. And recently, amongst other penalties that were paid by Glaxo, a $3 billion criminal civil case, they withheld information about the uh, drug Avandia, rosiglitazone, a diabetes drug, uh, from the FDA. And these are, again, as of July 18th, and there have been plenty more since then, and we will update this in four or five months, the total civil and criminal penalties paid by the leading, in this case, in terms of the penalties, companies, GlaxoSmith, 7.7 billion, uh, 7.56 billion, and I've added to the left that their profits in that, in just one year, were 7.7 .7 billion. So over a 20 year period, 21 and a half year period, they paid a total of 7.56 billion in penalties, but the profits were essentially more than that in just one year. And then for the other companies, the same thing. The left graph is what their profits were in that year, according to Fortune 500 or Glaxo, their annual report. This is an example. Uh, I got involved or interested in this seven years ago when uh, Purdue paid a $634 million criminal and civil penalty for illegal promotion of OxyContin. As I said, when we were talking about heroin, it was very similar. They got the word out that OxyContin was less subject to abuse and so forth, and given that physicians who prescribe opioids are concerned about this, they were very much attracted to it. And these are this is from the government's own criminal information when they filed this $634 million penalty, criminal and civil. Supervisors instructed sales representatives to use the reduced abuse liability statement and the amended statement to market and promote OxyContin. They said they would tell health, they could tell health care providers that OxyContin creates less chances for addiction than immediate release opioids. Again, no evidence for that. When this was announced, I quickly read this 70, or quickly over several days, read the 70 page criminal information and noted that <coughs> the company had sold $9.6 billion of OxyContin in just six years. And Arguably, the company should have been forced to disgorge more than just the less than half a billion 
that they were. Also three Purdue executives, a couple of them physicians as I remember, paid out of their own pockets criminal penalties, but they didn't have to go to jail. And at this point, no major drug company officials ever gone to jail for any of these criminal violations, even though in many cases they plead guilty to criminal charges. So this is the beginning of talking about the pipeline, as in with heroin there wasn't any obstruction at all, and increasingly over the last 10 years, part of the decision about what is going on beyond just approving or not approving a drug is how it's marketed and whether the government is being charged illegally too much money for it, making less money available for other kinds of things. This is from a column I, I have recently stepped aside, not stepped down as the director of the group I founded 42 years ago, and, and I got a call from the British Medical Journal asking if I would be interested in writing a regular column on anything I wanted for the British Medical Journal, and this was, I think, the second column I wrote. And the title of the column was, When the EMA, the European Medicines Authority, and the FDA Decisions Conflict, is it differences in the patients between Europeans and Americans, or is it difference in regulation? And I posed the hypothetical, rhetorical question, are people in this country more resistant to the risks and more likely to benefit from certain drugs than Europeans, or is it that the EMA is more resistant than the FDA to the drugs industry's desire to get approval for drugs with unique risks without compensating benefits? And I think in contrast to a lot, at least many, not all of the drugs in the cancer area, we wind up focusing on drugs that are the fifth or tenth or fifteenth or twentieth drug in the market, and they don't have any evidence of having a unique benefit, and all too often, including before approval, they have evidence of unique risks. And so if a drug has a unique, no unique benefit, a unique risk, why should it be approved? If this doesn't come to public attention until after approval, why should it stay on the market? So this was, not to borrow from a tale of two cities, but it was a tale of two diet drugs in two countries. These are two diet drugs that were approved in this country in 2012, within a month of one another. And one of them was approved by the FDA, it was called Belvic. Both of these drugs have a Q not followed by a U, which is something I'm not familiar with in English, and, but I guess they got into this. Euless Q or Qless drug or whatever. The weight loss drugs, Fenfen, you remember them, half of it's fentramine, an amphetamine like drug, and the other half is fenfluramine or dexfenfluramine, were banned in 1997 because many post approval cases of heart valve damage occurred. None of these had showed up with those drugs before approval, but with this drug, Belvic, the FDA approved the drug even though there was an almost statistically significant 16% increase in heart valve damage in randomized trials. And because of a concern about that, they unfortunately approved the drug but said that the company, after it was on the market, had to do post-marketing randomized trials to better evaluate the risk, including heart valve damage. But in Europe, au contraire, before the EMA had formally rejected the application for Locasterin or Belvic, they stated that it was of the provisional opinion that Belvic could not have been approved for weight control in obese and overweight patients because, quote, the benefits did not outweigh the risks. The committee's safety concerns included potential risk of psychiatric disorders such as depression and valvulopathy or heart valve damage, and they just turned it down they were on the verge of turning it down. The company withdrew the application so that it wouldn't be turned down. Second example, quasemia, the other Q without a U afterwards. And right after approving Belvic, the FDA approved a combination of fentramine, one of the drugs in Fenfen, and topiramate, which is an anticonvulsive drug, despite concerns about its cardiovascular risks. The risks included more patients with pulse increases more than 10 beats per minute, which is clearly a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, and increased arrhythmia-related adverse events. And other problems included increased kidney stones, cognitive disorders such as reduced concentration or attention, and memory impairment. 
And when it was approved in July 2012, the FDA hailed it as another treatment option. And they had taken off FenFen -fen back before, and everyone was hungry for more diet drugs, although the hunger for them is, from too many examples of dangerous ones having to be taken off the market, is kind of misplaced. But again, as they did with Belvic, they decided that a study was needed to clarify the risks of major adverse cardiac events, such as heart attack and stroke, but again, only after it was on the market. But in Europe, the EMA rejected Crisemia for the second time in February 2013, saying, quote, the main study showed clinically relevant weight loss following treatment. It was significant weight loss. It was 6 7% more than a placebo. But, but, and once you stop the drug, you start gaining weight again, though. Concerns about the medicine's long-term effects on the heart and blood vessels and about the long-term psychiatric <coughs> effects, depression, anxiety, and cognitive effects, memory, and attention. It concluded that the benefits did not outweigh its risks and recommended that it be refused marketing authorization. So, the message here is that two more, and I say more because there have been a whole string of diet drugs put on the market. PPA, phenylpropanolamine, was a nasal decongestant, caused hemorrhagic strokes in women particularly. It was taken off the market. We mentioned fenfen, dexfenfluramine, uh, heart valve damage, sibutramine, a drug that the FDA's own medical officer said shouldn't be approved because it increased blood pressure and pulse. And it was only taken off the market after a massive study. 5,000 people who were overweight got placebo, and 5,000 got the drug. And there's a significant increase in heart attacks and strokes. The EMA found it was too dangerous to be used for weight loss, both of these two drugs. But the drugs are considered by the FDA to be, quote, safe enough for Americans. And so as the rhetorical question at the beginning of this article was, it isn't resistance of Americans to the risk. The studies were done in this country and elsewhere, and there was no disagreement as to the findings of the studies by the EMA versus the FDA, but the intermittently dangerous malleability of the FDA that is the problem the case is discussed here. As at least many of you know, at a time of tight budgets, not unlike what is going on now, in 1992, the Congress decided unwisely, I think, that instead of having to take all the money to run the FDA out of the Treasury, they could just hit up the drug companies under what was then and is still now the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. So whenever a company sent in an application, whether it got approved or not, they had to pay what was called a user fee. And we believe in a survey we did of physicians in the FDA in about 90, 80, 70, 80, 98 and 97 the survey was done, really shows that things are not as good in many ways at the FDA because of the influence, not, no, no corruption involved here. This is not a company paying off to get a drug approved. It's just a change in attitude when roughly 70% of the whole FDA budget for reviewing drugs comes directly from the industry. This is a recent article by Dr. Janet Woodcock, who for the last 19 years, I believe, has been head of the drug division of the FDA. And she was bragging that we, in this country, are getting cancer drugs approved more quickly than, the UN, than in the EMA. Again, like the other cases, but I think that a distinction can and should be made between cancer drugs and essentially Me Too drugs that have a history of being taken off the market because of cardiovascular problems. So what she's saying is 35 cancer drugs were approved by the US or Europe from October 03 through December 10. Of these, FDA approved 32 in an average time of 8.6 months. The EU approved only 26, and its average time was 12.2 months, uh, significantly more. The difference in approval times is not due to safety issues with these products. This is a quote from this article. All 23 cancer drugs approved by both agencies during this period were approved first in the United States. Viva America. Now, if there weren't any problems with this, I, mean, I think that if you've got a breakthrough drug and there's really good evidence that it works, it is something that should be looked at more quickly and more carefully. Uh, there are now four pathways, the first of which is called accelerated approval, which 
accompanied the first Prescription Drug User Fee Act in 1992, and there are three others. The most recent is called Breakthrough Drugs, the other is called uh, Fast Track, and the other is called Priority Drugs. They all, in some way or other, provide ways for the FDA uh, to approve drugs more quickly, in some cases by requiring fewer numbers of people to get the drugs and so forth. Theoretically, a good idea. One of the problems is that the accelerated approval pathway requires only a surrogate marker. And a surrogate marker, I mean, lots of other drugs get approved with surrogate markers, but the surrogate marker here is tumor shrinkage. And one would think and hope, certainly, that if your drug is shrinking the tumor, that it may actually improve, improve survival. And the condition on which these drugs get through on accelerated approval is that they do have to do subsequent studies to look at whether there is an improvement in survival. This is from a statement from someone in FDA working on cancer drugs. And what he was saying was, that the proportion of cancer indications failing to confirm benefit, in other words, they get approved, accelerated track, or one of these other ones, because of tumor shrinkage, has significantly increased since 2005. It was 7.1 percent, it was almost a tenth, of more than a tenth in, in 2010. The delay from accelerated approval to restriction or withdrawal of the five indications is 2.1, 2.9, 10.1, 10.1, and 10.11 years. Now, with some drugs that didn't generally, and I think we all agree that cancer drugs have more toxicity, have that much toxicity, uh, that would be a big enough problem. But here, the idea is developing drugs that are treatments for diseases that don't have treatment or much better treatments for drugs that do. Decreasing the time on the market for potentially ineffective, as in tumor shrinkage, but no survival benefit. I mean, why would anyone take a cancer drug that has risk if you know that it only shrinks tumors and doesn't affect your longevity at all. So it's critical to decrease the time. And finally, in this section of what I'm talking about, Tom Fleming is an epidemiologist and statistician from the University of Washington, Seattle, who I met because I was on FDA's Drug Safety Advisory Committee for four years until a year plus ago. And what he's saying really bears paying attention to. Given that there seems to be a sense of urgency in completing the trial upon which accelerated approval is granted, in other words, shrinkage of tumor, is it fair to assume that we would have the same sense of urgency for the confirmation of the benefit? In other words, to show, yes, it shrinks tumor, but it also improves survival. In the first case, we are in danger of keeping dying patients away from potentially effective therapies. So, yes, the accelerated track makes sense, but it has to be accompanied by a quick second phase because if it turns out that all it does is shrink tumors, you're, expe you're exposing often hundreds, if not more, people to something that doesn't work really from their perspective and is very, very <coughs> toxic. So, to finish his sentence, In the first case, we are in danger of keeping dying patients away from potentially effective therapies. However, there is an equal danger that we are exposing patients to the toxicity of therapy without certainty of benefit. In both cases, it is incumbent upon those in drug development to decrease these time periods. And again, from the previous slide, three of these five drugs, it was 10 years between the time they were approved and the time it was either restricted or taken off the market. And there's 10 years where people were getting something that turned out not to work. Why does it take 10 years? I don't think there's any excuse. The first two did it in a reasonable period of time, 2.1 or 2.9 years. Before winding this up and turning this over to Ken, I just want to talk a little bit about what we have been doing. I, I left NIH where I was having a peaceful, non-confrontational academic existence for five years in the beginning of 72. I actually started to work while I was there on nights and weekends. I left over an issue that people in New England would be concerned about, which was contaminated intravenous fluids. But while I was at NIH, I got a call from a physician who I knew from my residency 
who said, do you realize that half the intravenous fluids in the United States are contaminated, but they're deciding not to recall them? I said, I knew they were contaminated, but I can't believe why they wouldn't recall them. And this was Abbott Laboratories. They had 50% of the IV fluid supply in the United States. And they convinced the <coughs> FDA that there would be a shortage of IV fluids if they recall these. And so they said, keep using these infected fluids. If your patient gets sick, then stop using them. I said, I can't believe someone would say that. He, you, at least three quarters of you remember Thermofax. It was before email and everything, the Thermofax. He faxed it to me, and that's exactly what was going to be published the next day in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports, which is the CDC document. And I saw it, and I called up the other companies and found that they had plenty of supplies, and Mr. Nader and I drafted a letter saying, take these off the market immediately. And they were taken off about two days later, despite having said they couldn't do this because of the public health problem. And that really launched me into saying there must be a lot of other problems like this, particularly when I got probably 50 phone calls after this was in the newspapers and on television, and it actually had happened. Uh, I, I say the connection with New England confounding because the FDA did learn something from that and tightened the standards in terms of what you need to do to approve particularly parenteral fluids that are going to go IV or something other than the mouth. But they seem to have exempted, at some level, the compounding pharmacists from this. So what do we do? So since I started this group, my background is in research. We collect, analyze data, estimate risk, formulate a petition. A petition is a summary of all the risks and benefits, and it's got a paragraph that says you have a law that allows you to do this. The letter we wrote to the head of the FDA to try and get the IV fluids off the market was an informal kind of petition. Litigation against the government. We don't do any other kind of litigation. And if we file a petition to ban or put a warning on a drug and they don't respond, we can sue them for unreasonable delay and it forces them to respond. They can agree or disagree with us, but they always have to respond. Teaching, as Joan mentioned, I'm an adjunct professor of medicine Western Reserve School of Medicine, and I also am on the faculty at Johns Hopkins, where we have residents in preventive medicine doing part of the residency. <coughs> uh, newsletter, we have a newsletter called Worst Pills, Best Pills, which has a circulation of about 160,000, and it is now on the internet. The book that Joan showed, we haven't put it out in print since 2005, but the entire book from 2005 is updated every six months. We published a number of medical journal articles on drug safety or other health kinds of issues. And with the exception of occupational health, which the media seems to have lost interest in, most of the things that we do are adequately covered in the print and electronic media. The point being that while we're waiting for the FDA to ban a drug or put a warning on, we can educate large numbers of people so that they don't necessarily have to injure themselves if there's good enough evidence that they shouldn't be using this drug. The reason we focus so heavily on drugs and adverse drug reactions, we do work on occupational health still, and we do some work on healthcare delivery, is that this is a major problem, drug-induced disease. Two million serious adverse reactions a year, these figures are probably larger now because they haven't been adjusted for more people and so forth. Estimated 100,000 number of ADR-related deaths, and it's one of the leading causes of death in this country. Uh, we do not easily or lightly or casually ask the FDA to ban a drug. Uh, we've done this in 42 years, 38 times, and most of them are off the market, some more quickly and some more slowly. <coughs> uh, Darwin, we petitioned to ban in 1978, and it was not banned until 30 plus years later. So two-thirds are banned, about a little more than a fifth, eight are in limited use, and five are still in wide use. As I said, at the same time that we're trying to petition and push the government to do something, we feel obligated to notify the public of the evidence upon which we base the petition. So our newsletter and our books accomplish this. These are just some examples of drugs that were ultimately taken off the market, all for safety problems, and when we first notify people in our publications. Uh, the bottom one, the longest interval, is 22 years, Darvon. We, we asked 
for it to be banned in 1978, but our first publication had on that was in 1988, was when our book was first published, and it was banned in 2010. Many of these other drugs, big selling drugs, we notified people six months, a year, two years, three years, four years before, and people appreciate that. They obviously we say, don't do anything without talking to your doctor, and they talk with their doctor, and some doctors will, when they read what the basis of, will listen and some will not. This is something that we have written about for a long time. We call it the seven year rule for safer prescribing. I wrote in a journal called the Australian Prescriber, I was asked to write something about this. And the idea is that unless the drug is a breakthrough drug, and I talked about that earlier, it is the only treatment for some disease or it's a clearly better treatment than something else. Most drugs don't fall into that category. So we say don't prescribe or imbibe, as in doctor or patient, any new drug except true breakthrough drugs for the first seven years after approval. We've done a, we published a study in the Journal of American Medical Association about 10 years ago looking at every drug approved in the United States over a 25 year interval and finding that a larger proportion of them wind up either being taken off the market or having a black box warning for something that was not known at the time of approval in the first seven years. That is not to say that after seven years nothing happens, but more information is obtained. Unfortunately for a number of these drugs, it's information that had been obtained before approval and the FDA unwisely often in contravention to the advisory committees approved it and then what had been suspected clearly before approval was found after approval, and when enough people died or were injured, they took it off the market. And finally, I think we're finished in a little less time, Ken? Yeah. Um, that's our website where we've got the last thousand reports, publications, petitions, testimonies, persistent.org forward slash HRG publications. That's, the next is the website for our newsletter and the updated version of the book, the drugs that were in the book then. And this, if you want to tell me something or ask me something, I may or may not be able to answer the questions. I will certainly talk with you about what you have in mind, is my email address. And thank you very much. I'm putting your first slide up so you don't have to go through all this stuff. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Ken Caton. He is the director of the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development, and he holds professorships in medicine, pharmacology, and public health and community medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. He is a visiting lecturer at the Tufts School of Business at Dartmouth College, and he serves on the faculty of the European Center for Pharmaceutical Medicine at the University of Basel. Dr. Caton writes and speaks regularly on factors that contribute to the slow pace and high cost of pharmaceutical R&D and the impact of efforts to speed the drug development process. He has provided public testimony before the U.S. Congress on pharmaceutical development, regulation, and policy issues, and he currently serves as an expert consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense on bioterror countermeasures initiatives. He is a former president of the Drug Information Association, and he is currently editor-in-chief of Expert Review of Clinical Pharmacology. He's on the editorial boards of a number of peer-reviewed journals, and he serves on the boards of directors and scientific advisory boards of several public, private, and not-for-profit life sciences companies and organizations. In 2011, uh, he received the Dr. Lewis M. Sherwood Award, granted by the Academy of Pharmaceutical Physicians and Investigators. He received a BS from Cornell University and his uh, master's and doctoral degrees in pharmacology from the University of Rochester. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Caton. Well, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to participate. It's actually always very nice to be able to speak to one of the sister institutions here in the Boston area. I'm not going to actually talk about the drug development process or the regulatory process per se, only because I'd rather talk about something that should be of interest to all of you here, and that is the, the landscape for innovation. It's the companies that bring these products to market that I think is so fascinating and actually what keeps me in my group. Let me say a little bit about who we are. My group is the Center for the Study of Drug Development. 
We're at Tufts University School of Medicine. We're the only academic group that exists that I'm aware of that focuses on the economic, legal, political, and regulatory issues that affect the development and regulation of pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical products. We've been in existence, in existence for about 38 years, and I've been with the group for 28 of those 38 years. And part of what keeps me there is, is that this is just such a fascinating topic, the innovation the landscape, and what it takes to get a new medicine to the medicine shelves of, uh, to, the, uh, to the medicine cabinets of uh, people who are taking those medicines, as well as pharmacy shelves, the people that are prescribing them. Um, I want to thank Brian Young for inviting me to participate. He's a former uh, member of my staff at the Tufts Center. Uh, just full disclosure, we get funding from a number of different sources, but we are funded in part by grants, unrestricted uh, educational grants from pharmaceutical firms as well as from other organizations, nonprofits, and foundations. So let me get right into this. <clears throat> We don't have a lot of time to go into in depth in some of these topics, so I just have three areas that I want to cover. I want to talk about the environment for pharmaceutical innovation and some of the specific issues that are affecting the development of new products. I want to share with you some of the metrics that my group collects on the time, the cost, and the risk of bringing new products to market because you really can't understand the challenges of getting new medicines to, to pharmacy shelves without understanding a little bit about what it takes to go through the process of bringing these products to market. And then I'll conclude with some comments about my views about the way the environment for innovation is changing. And this is a topic that, that's getting a lot of attention here in the Boston area. Some of you may, may or may not realize that we operate or we live in an area that is sometimes referred to as a super cluster. There are clusters of activity all around the country, all around the world, in fact. We represent something that is sometimes referred to as a super cluster because we have all of the main elements here in the Boston area that are necessary for bringing new innovative products to market. We have large pharma companies, but we have a lot of small and medium-sized pharma companies. We have biotech, we have many major academic research centers. We have something that a lot of other areas of the country don't have. We have a lot of venture capital and investment places. We have a lot of the patient groups have set up centers and set up offices here so they can interact with the industry. And when you bring all of those groups together, you end up with a dynamic mix that is a really a very fertile area for bringing new products to development, to market. And that's something I'll talk about at the very end. So let's start with the current landscape. You've heard about some of the challenges that the industry is going through, and I certainly won't defend the marketing and commercial practices of a lot of these companies. This is an industry which, in my view, does a tremendous job of bringing many life-saving and improving drugs to market, and then they go and they shoot themselves in, in the foot with a lot of the things that you just heard about uh, Dr. Wolf talking about. Nonetheless, this is an industry that's going through a tough time right now. This is just the most recent graph of the layoffs in the industry, and you can see that as of October, uh, already 20,000 layoffs in the pharma sector. Now, we don't feel that that much in the Boston area because, as I said, we're a super cluster. And actually, whereas a lot of companies are decreasing their workforce outside of the Boston company, those same companies are hiring people in their Boston offices. So, for example, Pfizer has downsized significantly in Connecticut and yet they're hiring people here in Boston for their offices here. So that just shows that in this area, it's dynamic. But for the rest of the area for the industry, especially in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, the layoffs are significant. So the question is, why should you care about all of this? Why should you care about the fate of this industry, whereas you already heard, they engage in some shifty practices and marketing issues that lead some to believe that there's really an industry that shouldn't be trusted. The reason why you should care about this is that about 95% of the drugs that you take that, you're, that are available to patients across this country are developed by the research-based pharmaceutical industry. 95, that's not to say that the basic research that provides the underpinnings of pharmaceutical products don't come from the NIH and from academic centers, but the actual development and commercialization of 95% of the products that are available come from the research-based industry. And despite the fact that there are all sorts of problems in the way the industry markets its products and there's need for reform because, frankly, it's somewhat disgraceful that, that they end up in these situations, the bottom line is we're on the verge of seeing things like cures for hepatitis C, a major killer up until most recently. 
uh, long-term treatment for uh, a chronic treatment for AIDS patients, whereas in the past that was a death sentence. Uh, cystic fibrosis, new treatments reaching the market. Lots of areas where at one point they were untreatable and now they become either chronic or in some cases they're actually cured as a result of pharmaceutical products that are available. So what are some of the challenges? And again, I'm going to focus on what are the challenges, not just for the pharmaceutical developers, but in the entire environment of the landscape of bringing products to market. We've heard a lot about, you hear a lot about in the New York Times, especially Wall Street Journal, Forbes, uh, or Financial Times in London, all of the publications that focus on the business of pharmaceuticals, that patents on many top selling products are expiring. And I'll talk in a minute about why that's an important issue. We know that the marketplace is highly competitive. <clears throat> it's no longer sufficient for most companies to simply develop products that are safe and effective. They really now need to also demonstrate that their products are cost effective, that they represent value to the patient. And this is because there's increasing stress on payers, insurance companies, and third party providers that are saying to the companies, look, you've got an interesting product here, but you've got to show us some economic value for using this drug or we won't, we won't cover it, we won't reimburse for it. This environment has existed in Europe forever, but it's only now becoming more important in the United States. Public support for the industry is low, we'll talk about that in a second. Regulatory hurdles are increasing, especially in the area of safety and risk assessment. Not a bad thing, it's just a recalibration of the risk benefit equation. And ultimately, perhaps the one area that the industry has pretty much under its own control, the time, cost, and risk of bringing products to market, despite the fact that this is an industry that is focused on improving this process over the past two, three decades, it still remains increasingly long, increasingly risky, and increasingly expensive. So let's just say a few words about the public view of the industry. Not, you wouldn't be surprised, based on what you just heard from Dr. Wolf, that the industry is not looked very highly upon by most of the public. This is a survey that's put out every year by the Harris Poll that I like to capture each time. Uh, this is the 2011 December issue uh, of this survey, and what it does is it asks, the, asks this intriguing question, which of these industries do you think is generally honest and trustworthy, so that if somebody came here to talk to you from that industry, would you believe what they're saying? And you can see pretty quickly where the pharmaceutical industry falls. I'll, I'll point on this side, so I'm sorry you won't be able to see this. Uh, pharmaceuticals fall pretty low on the list there. And think about when this survey was done, 2011. What were we just getting through at that point? Probably the worst economic, def not probably, the worst economic downturn since the Great Rece uh, Depression in the 1920s. And yet, where are the banks? They're actually higher than the pharmaceutical industry in this case. It's really very telling that from the public's perspective, the pharmaceutical industry is not very reliable, not very trustworthy, certainly not honest. Who, this is an American survey, so who, do, who does the American public think highly of? Well, we somehow think supermarkets are telling us the truth and we can depend on them, uh, even though that's only 31%. Hospitals, uh, when I show this at uh, hospitals, they usually take great pride in that they're very high up on the list, but. I like pointing out to them that 29% is really not a lot to be thrilled about. <laughs> Nonetheless, all of this is to suggest that there is a real problem with the pharmaceutical industry's perception within the public. And the reason why this is important is that public perception has a tremendous impact on Congress. Congress has an impact on the FDA because they make the laws that the FDA has to follow. And they also apply, uh, supply the appropriation for the money that the FDA has. And ultimately, FDA has an impact on industry. So it's a cycle where everybody benefits or pays the price, depending on the perception of the pharmaceutical industry here. So if the public doesn't trust the industry, who do they think is protecting them? Well, who do you think is protecting you? You assume that the FDA is protecting you from this industry. And yet, what's the public perception of the industry? Well, this is another survey, this time the Gallup Association. And where do they put the FDA? Worse than the IRS, imagine that. Worse than the IRS in terms of the perception of the job that the FDA is doing. Again, maybe some of this is in part the concern about unsafe drugs being taken off the market. I'd say a lot of it had to do with this long period of time 
uh, over the over the previous administration, the two terms of the previous administration, where there wasn't a full-time FDA commissioner for much of that period to articulate the mission and the vision of the FDA. Ultimately, the public is not happy here. But I think it's important to think a little bit about the role of the FDA here. The FDA, as you heard, is responsible for balancing the the need to ensure that effective drugs reach patients who are waiting for those drugs, but also protect patients from unsafe drugs that should reach the market. The important thing to understand here, it's a balance, obviously, but the important thing to really understand here is that the fulcrum for that balance, the, the point, the pivot point, is really adjusted by the public, and it's adjusted by culture. So at various periods of time in the United States, we may see that, that balance shift where the FDA is more willing to allow unsafe uh, drugs that onto the market with the hope that they'll be safe and accept some of the risk in some, involved in that. Or it may shift the other way at other times where they're less willing to allow those drugs on the market. And this may also be different in different countries or different regions of the world. Everybody has their own balance. So for example, and this is when I teach a course at Tufts uh, at the medical school on principles of drug development, this is the way I describe it to them. And then this is my crash course on FDA regulation for the last 30 years. In the 1990s, the FDA was viewed to, as too slow. This is coming off of the AIDS epidemic in the late 1980s, early 1990s. The view was the FDA was taking too long to get new drugs on the market. There was a tremendous amount of pressure. There were congressional hearings on this. And everything came to the same conclusion. The FDA has to speed up the process of review of new drug applications. The result was, part of the result, was the FDA Prescription Drug User Fee Act that you heard about previously, which allowed companies to provide funding to the FDA in exchange for a faster review process or a more efficient review process. Not an approval process, a review process. In other words, the FDA could still determine that the drug should not be approved, but they had to make that determination more quickly. That was the 1990s. Drugs were getting to the market very quickly during that time period. The FDA was really in high gear. Then what happened? Well, the 2000s, we heard a lot of drugs that were being taken off the market. Resilin, for example. Vioxx, you may have heard the drug, the COX-2 inhibitor Vioxx for arthritis, was taken off the market. There were a lot of public headlines about the fact that unsafe drugs were having to be taken off the market. What was also going on, or, on it during this period? Well, it was really what was not going on. There was no, really com no real compelling medical need that the public was rallying behind. There were no epidemics, there were no crises, there was no, AIDS was at this point now being viewed as a controlled disease, a chronic disease, and so the balance shifted. Now it was the FDA is too slow, it's too fast, we have to slow the process up. And as a result, in 2007, where there was a reauthorization of that user fee act, which has to be reauthorized every five years, there were aspects of that reauthorization that put tremendous new powers, gave the FDA tremendous new powers to look at safety risk issues and give the FDA for the first time the authority to take a drug that's already on the market and when they see a safety problem, go back to that company and say, we want you to do new studies on that drug. They never had that authority before. This all really came out of the fact that Vioxx, which was taken off the market, uh, there were safety problems that were evident, but the FDA had no authority to go back to the manufacturer or Merck and say, we want you to do new analyses here. They didn't have that authority. Now they do have that authority. So lots of things changed at that. Now we're in the first decade of, or in the second decade of this century. What, what do you think the main issue is here? Too fast, too slow, what's left? You'll never get this. It's the FDA is killing jobs. You may have heard this a lot during the campaign. It was certainly brought out quite a bit during the uh, the discussions. During the, the each of the platforms of the two of uh, uh, the two parties said the same thing. The FDA was killing jobs. The FDA approval process is making small companies fold and move overseas. All of this comes down to one thing: the FDA is not in the business of making jobs. That's not in their statute. They have no responsibility to address this issue. But I think what it all comes down to is the. The FDA is dealing with a balance. They're dealing with two completely different forces. One of them saying slow up, one of them saying speed up, and ultimately the FDA is in this position. It's not the forces that are saying slow up, it's not the ones that are saying speed up. It's, there's the FDA, I don't know if you could see the foot there. 
here, I'll, I'll show you on this side. There's the little foot there and the hair. So that's the, that's the position of the FDA, at least the way in my, in my view of the situation they're in. These two tremendous, tremendous forces that are pushing on the FDA to move things forward or to slow them up. Let's say a few things about patents because this is getting a lot of attention. This is an analysis that looks at, um, looks at four years worth of top selling drugs that are going off patent and, and what, those, what the value of those drugs are uh, across the board. So we see some drug names you may rec might recognize Lipitor, the cholesterol lowering drug which went off patent two years ago that earned about $12.5 billion a year. Uh, this year we see a total of about $13 billion in potential lost value. Why is this so important to the industry and why does this get so much attention? Part of the reason why it gets so much attention is that the industry business model over the years has evolved to relying very heavily on very few products to generate the revenue to sustain its own growth. In other words, the industry actually derives only uh, uh, its growth revenue from only about two or three products in its portfolio. Seven products earn less than the average cost to develop a new drug. So the industry is highly reliant on these products, and those happen to be the products that were on this list here, and so that they were struggling. What's the other interesting thing about this? Well, the interesting thing about this, some people say, well, but they're going off patent. That doesn't mean that there's generic competition right away. Well, in fact, in the United States, it does. Generally, a, com a compound will lose 80% of its value within the first few months after it goes off patent. Not biologicals, because they still are protected to some degree, but small molecules, the most of the medicines you're used to, they lose about 80% their value within a very short period of time. And then after that, they really have no value um, to speak of. That's why this industry is struggling with this particular issue. So here are some of the industry leaders in terms of lost value, names you're familiar with, Pfizer, Lilly, Bristol-Myers Squibb, GlaxoSmithKline, the other companies there. You can see Pfizer taking a, the biggest hit of all. Not surprisingly, the companies that are having the biggest hit in terms of loss of patent life, those are the ones that are going through some of the most dramatic change now. Pfizer is in the process of fragmenting itself. It's actually breaking apart. It's too big, it's too unwieldy, it's the operational costs are too great, and the company is actually going through a fragmentation process right now. Other companies are engaging in other types of initiatives to try to improve efficiency or change their business models. So what's the issue with the patents? Patents have existed since the, 19, since the 1700s. The idea was that once a patent expires, new products would take its place. The original patent holder would come up with new molecules. So why is this not happening now? Why is there a concern about this? Well, it's not for lack of investment. Some of the major companies now are investing enormous amounts of money in R&D, or research and development, to develop new products. You can see here Novartis at about $8.8 .8 billion in research expenditures just this past year, in 2012, just with the hope of bringing new products to the marketplace. But what are they getting for all this investment? Well, for those people that ever go to, people in the pharma sector or the pharma circles, go to meetings and they see versions of this slide over and over again. These are, in the shaded part, the R&D expenditures of the research-based companies based here in the United States, or R&D expenditures in the United States. And the little dots are new molecular entities or new drug approvals that are based on a new active ingredient in the United States. And what we can see in this graph is that if you look first at the, the little dots, you see that there was a little blip in the mid-1990s. In fact, in 1996, there were 53 new drug approvals, by far the largest number we've ever seen. But if you look at the more recent years, you notice something interesting. Going back in time all the way to the 1970s, the numbers of new drug approvals has really not changed all that much. Each year, there's between, oh, I'd say about 15 and 25 new drugs that reach the market, or maybe 20 to 30 new drugs that reach the marketplace. So we're not seeing really much of a productivity decline in the industry. What we are seeing in terms of challenge is that shaded bar, which is showing a dramatic increase in the overall cost to develop these products. And so the number of products that are reaching the market now, for the industry's, from the industry's perspective, there's not enough out there to generate the revenue to sustain this industry's own growth. And that's a major problem for the industry and part of why we're seeing so much restructuring across the board. We're also seeing new business models across the industry. 
what they're doing is they're looking for new ways of generating revenues that were not looked at in the past but may be effective now. So one of the most dramatic changes that we're seeing in the industry is that in the past, this was an industry that really only wanted high volume products. They wanted products that could be used by hundreds of millions of people. I mean, why would they focus on a, on a drug that only worked in a small number of people? But by giving it to lots of people, they could keep the marginal cost down. It wouldn't be as expensive per, per unit to bring that product to market. That model has completely shifted within the industry. Now the focus is low volume, high margins. And there's lots of reasons or lots of prototypes that led the industry to the conclusion that this was a better business model for them. But across the board, every single major company out there is now looking at what are sometimes referred to as orphan drugs or drugs for rare diseases or targeted medicines or sometimes they call them personalized medicines or precision medicines all of this with the assumption that by looking at a smaller population, they know who's going to take the drug, they know that the drug will work in that population. More importantly for the companies, they're much more likely to get reimbursement at the price that they're going to charge for that drug. In other words, they can get premium pricing on that drug. The important thing to consider on this, despite the fact that every major company is moving this direction, is this a sustainable approach? Well, here's a, an editorial that uh, two of my colleagues at the Tufts Center have uh, written, Joshua Cohn, who's an economist, and Chris Milne, who's a lawyer. Um, uh, we have a multidisciplinary group, by the way. We have economists, a lawyer, a molecular biologist, uh, a MBA, a pharmacologist, a pharmacist, and a physician on the staff. Uh, this was looking at some of the orphan diseases that are out there, and you can see right away, these are diseases you don't see every day. Fabre's disease, short bowel syndrome, uh, Gaucher's disease, uh, some, some unusual diseases with very small patient populations, but look at the annual cost per patient over there on the right uh, column. Huge cost. Interestingly, every one of these compounds, every one of these drugs is currently being covered by payers. Payers are willing to cover this. Why? Because they say, well, it's a very small population. We don't have that many people that are going to be, that, that's going to cost us a lot. But remember I said every major company is looking at small population drugs now? We're headed to a period where these payers are going to have to cover a lot of drugs that are costing this kind of amount. It's an unsustainable model. And we're already seeing the effects of it in places like Europe, where they've always been much more cost conscious. This is from Bloomberg News and orphan drug prices under siege in Europe. Some of you may know Vertex, one of our local companies here in Cambridge, uh, last year came up with the first real treatment for cystic fibrosis. It's a very narrow population of cystic fibrosis patients. I think only 10% of the patients will be able to use this drug. And yet you may be able to quickly look in this, in this piece here and see that some of the health covered plans, some of the plans in Europe are saying, we're not gonna, we're not gonna reimburse for that. You've gotta either lower your price or we're not gonna cover it. That's an interesting environment in Europe where the, where the governments, where they are the payers for all these medicines can say, we're just not gonna cover this medicine. If you've got a problem and if you're a cystic fibrosis patient in this country, you may have to go outside the country to get that drug. So that model that the industry is following right now is a questionable model of focusing so heavily on these drugs. Let me say something about the second part of this, the metrics that we collect. Here's the metrics on bringing a new drug to market based on some of the things that we've looked at. <clears throat> Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, the process, the overall process. When I teach, I use, a metaphor, I use a funnel as a metaphor because it captures the idea that there are huge numbers of compounds that start at the very beginning of the process in the basic research phase, which typically doesn't happen in industry. As I said earlier, it happens in the NIH or it happens in academic centers. But then as you move down the process, you end up at the stage where you do development and the commercialization of the product. An IND, which is an investigational new drug application, allows you to do clinical studies. And by that point, you're really winnowing down the number of compounds you're studying. Then you have the three phases of clinical development, phase one, two, and three, which is progressively looking at first in healthy volunteers, and then later on in small numbers of patients, and then in large multi-center studies looking at patients. Uh, the three stages of clinical development, you submit your application, the new drug application or NDA or a biologics license application, a BLA to the FDA. They review it and they launch it and even then there's more that happens. There are these phase four studies similar to what you heard uh, Dr. Wolf talk about, studies that the FDA asks 
or requires companies to do post-approval, risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, uh, PMS, not what you think it is, it's post-marketing surveillance, life cycle management, other things that are being done by these companies after the drug is on the marketplace. Very, very long, cumbersome process from the beginning of the funnel to the end. It could be anywhere between 15 to 18 years, depending on the therapeutic area. An area, though, that is getting a lot of attention now is sometimes referred to, especially in academic and industry circles, as the valley of death. It's also sometimes referred to as the translational abyss. You may have heard the term translational medicine, translational science, translational research. Those are all pretty much the same term. In fact, Northeastern is a partner of ours, Tufts Medical School, in our Clinical and Translational Science Award, which is a large multi-center award that's granted by the NIH. Only 61 institutions have it in the United States now to look at translational research and to readjust academic environments to make, to foster translational research and to become, for lack of a better term, better partners to industry in commercializing these products. The view of the NIH is we're not the National Institutes of Science, we're the National Institutes of Health. All of the grants that the NIH is giving out should be geared toward improving healthcare and finding new treatments, cures, and other things to improve the overall well-being of the American public. And that's the way the NIH is viewing it, and that's why they're giving out these big awards. But the real issue is this valley of death, and that's the area where so many products fail. And why do they fail? They fail because Animal models are typically not sufficient for understanding whether a product is going to work or is going to be safe once it goes into human beings. So in other words, when you think of diseases like depression or schizophrenia or some of the other psych psych psychological indications, that's just one example of there are no animal models to test. You have no way of knowing before you enter a human study whether these drugs are going to work or not. And so ultimately, you're entering blind. And that's in part why so many compounds fail there. The, the solution to that is what is sometimes referred to as biomarkers or surrogate markers or better ways to determine in advance whether these products are going to work or not. And that's why so many academic centers now are focused on translational research and medicine and why so many companies are focused on that as well. I'll share with you some of our metrics on overall development times. This is looking at different therapeutic areas. Uh, CNS refers to central nervous system drugs. These are neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease as well as psych psychoactive or psychiatric diseases such as depression or psychosis. And then the other categories are, are pretty much self-evident uh, going down the list. CNS indications almost always take the longest. The purple part of these bars refer to clinical development time or the time that these, tusks, these, these, uh, these drugs are tested in human subjects. And the little bar at the end, at the end of each of them, represents the FDA approval time for those products. And what we see is almost nine, over nine years of just testing in human subjects for these CNS compounds. And then when you add the overall time for FDA approval of those or review of those products, the overall time is over 11 years, or around 11 years, to bring those products to market. Keep in mind that that doesn't include the overall preclinical testing phase in animals or research phase. When you add all of that together, it comes out to about 16 or 17 years. Or as I tell my students, it's enough time to be born and then go to college. That's how long it takes to get those products to the marketplace. And you see the other therapeutic categories there. Anti-infectives typically at the bottom of the list go through the process in about half the time that it takes the CNS compounds to go through. Why the difference? Well, I tend to think of it in terms of two major measurements. One of them is how easy it is to measure whether the drug works or not, and the other is how long is the drug going to be used for. Anti-infectives <laughs> tend to be used over short periods of time, as you know, and the outcome is pretty easy to measure. Does it kill the bacterium, or does it kill the virus, or the fungus, or not? And basically, you know before you start human testing whether the drug is going to work or not, because you could test that in a Petri dish. So those drugs tend to go through the process very quickly. In the middle of the cardiovascular drugs, when you think of drugs for lipid-lowering drugs, for uh, cholesterol, or reducing high blood pressure, or removing arrhythmias, pretty easy to measure whether these things actually work or not. And you could test those in animals. But once you give them to people, they take them over their lifetime for the most part. And so they sort of fall in the middle. And then the worst case, or the most difficult case scenario, the CNS products, 
very hard to measure, as I said earlier, whether the drug is going to work or not before you get into it. And even once you start the human studies, it's hard to tell whether the drug is working or not because when you think of diseases like senile dementia or Alzheimer's, people tend to fluctuate in and out of lucid periods. And so when you're giving the drug, if someone seems to get better, is it the drug effect or are they just cycling? It means your studies have to be much bigger and they have to go longer and it's harder to get through that process. And when you give the drugs, they tend to be given over long periods of time. So they fall into the most difficult category. So that's in terms of overall development time. What about the risk of development? One of the major issues for the industry is the drugs that fail in development. I think few people realize the extent of failure in clinical development as products move through the pipeline. In fact, only about 16% of drugs that start tested, that begin testing in human subjects actually will reach the marketplace. And there's big variation across different therapeutic categories. So based on some of our more recent data, 24% of the systemic anti-infectives that start development will reach the market. And that's the best category. The CNS compounds with those very long development times, they're actually the worst at only 8.2%, meaning that about 92% of those compounds will fail in development. To make it worse for the, for the CNS compounds, to emphasize the challenge in that therapeutic area, I'll just show you this slide. It's a little complicated, so I'll just take you the first stage for orientation. These are called phase transition probabilities. It's the likelihood of a compound starting a clinical phase of development moving to the next phase of development. So what we see here is for musculoskeletal compounds, 72% of those that start phase one will move to phase two. 35% that start phase two will move to phase three, and 80% of those that start phase three will move on. You can see right away that the most failure occurs in phase two. That's when you first start looking at efficacy, and that's the most common reason for failure for all drugs. Now let's look at a worst case scenario and a best case scenario. CNS drugs, here's the worst case. 60% of them will succeed in phase one and move on to phase two. If you're gonna fail, you should fail early, so in fact, that's not too bad. But that's only under the assumption that things get better later on. What we see is a very low success rate in phase two. Only a third of them will succeed in phase two. And then here's the worst case for the industry. 46% of those will fail in phase, uh, 46 will succeed in phase three, meaning that more than half of these compounds are still gonna fail when they get to phase three. Now, when you think back a little bit to that slide that I showed you of the overall clinical development times, it was 9.2 years <coughs> to develop these products in clinical testing. When, does the, when are these products, when are these 54% of the products failing? They're failing about seven or eight years into clinical development. An enormous amount of resources and effort and money going into developing these compounds only to see them fail. Before I talk about the ramifications of that, here's a best case scenario. Low success rate in phase one for the systemic anti-infectives. If they're gonna fail, most likely they're gonna fail for one of two reasons. Either safety is a problem or, <clears throat> as is often the case with these, economic reasons <clears throat> or commercial reasons. In other words, they can't compete with what's on the marketplace so they get killed very early. However, once they get through that initial hurdle, their success rates are pretty high and they look pretty good moving forward. But the CNS products, it represents a major problem for, for consumers, for patients, for families of patients, because many of the major, ph major pharmaceutical companies have already decided they don't want to be in this area. So this is from the Wall Street Journal showing that four of the major pharma companies, AstraZeneca, GlaxoSmithKline, Sanofi, and Merck, have all either significantly reduced or eliminated their investment in CNS product development. What does this mean overall? Well, think about it. This is a growing population, especially with the aging of the, the graying of the population in the United States. We're gonna see probably an epidemic of senile dementia and Alzheimer's disease as we move forward, and yet we have no real treatments for that at all yet. And, and all of the other diseases associated, or the CNS diseases associated with aging, all of this represents for the industry a gigantic market. And yet what they're saying is the market is not large enough to justify being in this area because the risk of development is too great. Risk often will determine whether operational technical risk will often determine whether companies move in a particular area. So moving to the third part of this, which is the overall cost of bringing products to market, long development times associated with high risk end up meaning that there are high cost of drug development. 
These are studies that we put out periodically. They look at the overall cost of bringing a sample of drugs to market. These are all self-originated compounds, which means they're all developed and brought to market by one company. We don't look at drugs that are licensed in or and because the costs are built into royalty payments, milestone payments, and everything else. It's a little more complicated to calculate that. These are just self-originated compounds. These are fully capitalized costs, which means they include the opportunity costs or the money that's tied up in investing over long periods of time, and they include the cost of failures. Our most recent study, which was in, 19, in 2007, was that the overall cost in that last cluster was about $1.3 billion per successful compound, $1.2 billion for biopharmaceutical compounds. The important thing about, well, and I should mention that we're just in the process of updating this study, all the data are in, we have it all analyzed, we're in the process of putting together the new paper on this, and it will be submitted to the Journal of Health Economics, which is where we always submit these, the, probably the most prestigious of all health, journal, uh, uh, health economics journals, and we hope to have this sometime in the middle of next year uh, published and be able to reveal the, the actual figure. I should mention something about these figures, because of all the studies we do, it's a lightning rod, unlike anything else that we do. And most of it is because it's used in different ways. In some cases, it's used from policy discussions. In some cases, it's used, and we don't endorse any of this stuff, and sometimes it's used by companies to justify the prices they're going to charge in their compounds. And sometimes it's used in political discussions about what incentives should be provided to the industry to improve innovation or to encourage innovation. The bottom line is we see criticism at both ends. So this is from a series of articles that appeared or part of a blog during the summer in Forbes, one of the big business magazines. You can see they took our figure and they said, you can see right there, the average drug development, uh, drug developed by a major pharmaceutical company costs actually between four billion and 11 billion. In case you hear those outrageous figures, you know, remember we're 1.3 billion. Where do you hear though? What does that come from? The way they calculated those costs is they took the average cost of R&D or the average amount of money spent by R&D by a company and divided it by the new product appro approvals by that company. Now, nobody really, no economist certainly would endorse that approach because there's investment in R&D today does not translate into new products approved today. It, it refers to new products that are been approved way down the line. Plus, a lot of other costs are, are tied in with R&D costs that don't result in new molecular entities or new active ingredients. So there are all sorts of problems with that, but you end up with these outrageous costs. So that's one extreme. And then there's another extreme, and there are lots of people that have looked at, taken our study once again and broken it down or deconstructed it as it's sometimes referred to, and come out with figures that are about, well, in this case, you see from the British Medical Journal, uh, Light and Leshen saying that it's actually around $60 million to develop a new drug. 1.3 billion, 60 million. How do you come up with that figure? Well, one of them is you throw out all opportunity costs, all of the cost of investment, which is an economic principle that everybody in this room should understand just based on your own spending habits. You know that an investment today and a, an acquisition of something today is not the same as acquiring something later on. The investment cost is greater for something that you don't get access to until later on, and that's the case with the pharma sector. There are other reasons, other things that were done in this study. If any of you are interested in this, we have a full piece in our, on our website that refutes or goes through every one of these arguments and explains uh, the, the rationale behind the methodology that we've used. I should mention, in terms of methodology, this was vetted by the Office of Technology Assessment in the United States, Con in, the, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, their assessment was that we used the correct methodology, and ultimately, they just used a different interest rate in calculating the cost and came up with a higher figure than we came up with when they did their figure. All of this to say there are studies that should, there are arguments that say it should be more, there are arguments that say it should be less, and we stand behind our study because we know it's the only one that's based on actual cost figures. Why are the costs so high? Well, we believe that some of it has to do with the fact that more and more companies are looking in the areas of chronic and complex indications. Clinical trial size is growing because of that. Patient recruitment and retention, getting subjects to enroll in clinical trials is an increasingly important bottleneck in the process. Part of why so many companies are looking overseas, especially to emerging economies, to do their clinical studies. We've done a series of studies showing that the complexity of clinical studies or the protocols have increased, and some of the other things that we talked about, which I won't go through here. 
So the last thing, I just want to talk about how the bioinnovation landscape is changing. Clearly, there's a transformation in many aspects. I mentioned the changing to orphan drugs or narrow indications earlier, but perhaps the one of the most significant changes and one that I really believe will have an impact in the way new products are brought to market is the growth of integrated partnerships or strategic relationships and alliances between all of the major sectors or among all of the major sectors in the bioinnovation landscape. So here's just some, uh, some examples, and I won't go through all of these, I'll just mention one or two of them. The <coughs> academic industry partnerships is one that's getting a tremendous amount of attention. Here in the, in the Boston area, we have a lot of these academic industry partnerships. What's changed is that in the past, these were much more of the, you might call, opportunistic investing. In other words, if, if Merck saw something that, something that was going on at Northeastern that was very interesting, they might give you a $100,000 or a $200,000 grant to continue doing that research. That's not the way industry is funding research that much anymore. What they're doing is saying, we want to foster a particular platform or an area of research, and we'll see what, what comes out of that. And one of the more interesting and novel approaches to this is Pfizer's approach, which is sometimes, which is referred to as the Centers for Therapeutic Innovation, or CTIs. There's one here in the Boston area. There are 11 institutions that are part of the Boston CTI for Pfizer. Uh, uh, Tufts is one of them. All of the major teaching hospitals, BU, um, uh, um, uh, Harvard, uh, and all of some of the other institutions are all part of this. What makes this unique, what makes this new approach unique, is that three things. First of all, Pfizer gives money to academic postdocs to do research, but those postdocs actually work in a dedicated facility over in the Longwood area, where they actually can interact not only with other academics from other institutions that are also being funded, but they get access to all of the sophisticated screens, which for an academic sometimes is like being in fantasy land to get access to some of the expensive tools that industry has access to. The other thing that's interesting about the CTI is that they, instead of waiting until afterwards when they see something they want to bring in house and then first go to the technology transfer office of the academic institution, what they did is they worked out all of their agreements with the tech transfer offices in advance. So if they want to license something in, if they want to take it in house, it's all taken care of in advance. They don't get held up. Academics prefer this model as well. And then the third thing that they did that was interesting is that if something is not going to be brought in-house for Pfizer's development, all of the rights revert back to the academic institution, something industry didn't like doing in the past. But now academics feel much more comfortable about this. If Pfizer is not going to develop it, they get complete access to it again. They could sell it to anybody else. They could sell it to Novartis or Sanofi or anybody who was interested or spin out a company and develop it themselves. All of this to say there are new models, there are new initiatives, new thinking in terms of how to bring these products to market. Another relationship, and the only other one I'll mention, is the patient group relationship. Same thing as I mentioned with the academics, much more in terms of opportunistic investing. That was the way it was in the past. Typical grants were around the forty dollars or $50,000 range. Think of this new drug that, that Vertex brought to market last January, uh, Kaleidico, the first major drug for cystic fibrosis. That drug, I think it's fair to say, would have never reached the market if it weren't for the investment and the access to patients provided by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. They provided about $75 million in funding, plus access to their patient pool, which enabled this product to eventually reach the marketplace. I would say that this represents the new model for these patient groups, more activist patient groups, that don't want to just give money when they see something that's interesting, but they actually want to guide the process and have a seat at the table as things move forward. And we're seeing that with, I mentioned some of the others, the Breast Cancer Alliance, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and many others that are out there that are trying to do the same thing. Ultimately, we're moving more into what is sometimes referred to as a fully integrated pharmaceutical network. In this new integrated approach, academic centers, you can see here, is still involved in basic research and translational medicine, but through the coordination and management of large pharma companies. Large pharma companies want to get out of that space because it's too expensive and too risky for them. And yet, academic institutions want to partner with industry because they need uh, more revenue. <coughs> Small companies will still be involved in this, especially as they bring products to market, and other providers will play a role as well. The bottom line here is that they're all working together in integrated partnerships moving forward. At the other 
I think we're moving into even a more, uh, a different type of model. We're moving more and more into something that I'm terming innovation nodes. Innovation nodes are going to be based more on individual therapeutic areas or disease states. Individual companies will be part of an innovation node if that's something that they want to be involved in. For example, companies like Bristol Myers Squibb, probably heard of that name, used to be involved in many, many different therapeutic areas. They predominantly now want to be the oncology company. So all of their efforts are in oncology. They're able to devote more resources to that area where they feel that they have strength. Other groups that will be involved in that node represent the the patient groups, small companies, academic centers, hospitals, all of the other entities that have a vested interest in moving forward in that particular area. Individual companies will be involved in all these different nodes depending on what areas they're interested in. And you can see right away that the purple company here has a relationship with the orange company because they're both in rheumatoid arthritis, this area here. But the purple company will also have a relationship with the blue company because they're both involved in are they both in, in, in rheumatoid arthritis as well? But you see that there are all these relationships and the nodes will talk to each other because of the simple fact that the pathophysiology of a lot of these diseases overlap. So basically, are there any examples of this? Yes, there is. The one example is sometimes is referred to as the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. Started off with 12 companies in 2010. Now there are 22 companies involved, as well as patient groups, academic centers, and others that are interested in finding better screens for developing Alzheimer's drugs. The bottom line, the innovation landscape is changing. It's certainly something we can feel here in the Boston area because we have so many of those elements already existing right here in the Boston community. In the new environment, all the stakeholders will have a place at the table. They'll share in the risks of reward, uh, risks of bioinnovation, but they'll also share in the reward of bioinnovation. And so will patients as these new products reach the marketplace. Bottom line here, the time and cost and risk to bring new products to market still represent formidable challenges for the industry as well as for all of the other stakeholders involved. But it's these challenges combined with all of the other environmental challenges that are leading to these changes in business models, a heightened focus on efficiency, and ultimately these integrated partnerships and alliances which I think are reshaping the landscape for innovation. The industry has been very successful as well with its stakeholders in bringing a lot of a, a fair number of, of life-saving and life-improving products to market, but even for academic centers that used to operate in the basic science sphere and not really interact with industry and didn't want to have to do with industry, all of this is changing. It's no longer sufficient to look back and smile and say, it worked in the past, we don't have to worry about it. The real issue for all of these stakeholders is to look forward, identify obstacles, and find a path to bringing new products to waiting patients. Um, this is our website here. If any of you are interested in some of the papers we put out, or as I mentioned, that, that piece that we have on the cost of drug development, you're welcome to, uh, to check that. If you want to contact me directly, feel free to do that as well. And thank you.